So I feel like there are very few Pokemon that are as frequently compared to their counterparts as Pidgey. The OG normal bird Pokemon has probably landed on everyone's team as a kid at some point, because it's so damn accessible being a 50% encounter on the first route in the game. Coupled with the fact that you pretty much need a flyer in every game up until HMs were removed in Gen 7, it's easy to see why so many have grown attached to the Pidgey line. As kids, I feel like the general consensus was that Pidgey is a very solid team member, the best bird on the market maybe. But in recent years, the Pidgey slander has become very prominent and I can definitely see why. Off the bat, Pidgey just doesn't hit as hard as the other normal flying counterparts like Firo and Dodrio. Now offense isn't everything, but in gens 1-3, to physical attack in particular is definitely worth a lot for the basic birds, since healing moves like Roost don't exist yet for defensive mons, and flying and normal are both physical types before the split, so special attacking flyers can't rely on their best stat, or special moves like Air Slash since they don't exist yet. Pidgeot has decent defenses, and its stats advertise it as a mixed attacker, but it can't actually make use of them for these reasons. Gen 3 just doesn't play well to the strengths of Pokemon like Pidgeot, who are trying to be a little bit more than just a physical attacker. And at the end of the day, with the shallow move pool of Gen 3 being what it is, you are teaching these Pokemon Fly, probably using your single use return TM on them for dual stab, and if they get another strong flying move that doesn't take two turns like Drill Peck, even better. Anything else is a nice, but probably minor bonus. These early generations truly were the heyday for the hard-hitting flying types like Firo and Dodrio, who can all hit fast and hard. And Pidgey can do this too, but undeniably not as well, and thus has earned a reputation for being outclassed as a result. I've also seen a lot of people slander Pidgey's design. Out of all the birds, Pidgey's stats are the most balanced, or, to put a more negative light on it, most average, and I think that gets grouped into his design as well. I've heard a lot of people call this line, basic bird evolves into bigger bird into even bigger bird. And yeah, I get that it's a simple design as many in Gen 1 are, but I feel like there's more personality here than people give the line credit for. Pidgeot's dex entries go in depth about how expert of a flyer it is, controlling the wind at insane speeds of Mach 2 with his powerful wings. Pidgeot is the most majestic looking of the early gen birds, and I definitely see it as a skilled pilot who is very prideful of its grace and dexterity in the air. My headcanon is that out of all the normal birds, Pidgeot was the only one who actually attended flight school, while the others like Firo were smoking cigarettes in the parking lot, or overslept, or found a cool stick on the ground. Pidgeot has a good head on his shoulders, went to a good college, and worked a steady job to put himself through school so it would make sense that Pidgeot picked up a few unique flying moves along the way. But this isn't really the case, since the lineup of moves isn't diverse enough in Gen 3. Yeah, we can learn Fly in Return, and a filler move like Wing Attack, but so can everyone else, what gives? Well, okay, you might argue, but Pidgey has perfect availability in Kanto, surely that counts for something? Well, unfortunately, the first gym leader is Brock, who Pidgey obviously doesn't fare very well against. Now I could give it moves to put up a fight here, like maybe Mudslap, but when two out of the three starter options absolutely destroy this gym anyway, I really don't think it would matter much in the end. Helping against Brock just doesn't have a lot of value if you pick Squirtle or Bulbasaur, and we get the aforementioned better option in Spiro on the very next route who is faster, stronger, and fully evolves earlier. So I hope I've made it clear why Gen 3 is really not Pidgey's time to shine. For Gen 3 normal flyers, all that really matters is how hard you can hit with fly in return, and whether or not you can learn moves like Drill Peck. Defensive and special attacking flyers just don't excel here because there are no special base flying and normal type moves, and defensive moves like Roost don't exist yet. So despite Fire Red being the most obvious choice at first glance, I'm actually going to take us through Gen 4's Heart Gold Soul Silver today, which fixes all the problems I just mentioned. Not only do we now have the physical special split, but are also introduced to a lot of solid new moves which we'll dive into a bit later. Pidgey is also available on the very first route here, and definitely outclasses Noctowl in a lot of ways. Don't worry Noctowl, we'll get to you one day too. Now in Johto, there are more flying types to compete with, like the Zubat line, who now has a flashy new evolution, 
but there's definitely more breathing room in Kanto in terms of when Pokemon become available. Zubat will be pretty weak until it evolves at level 22. It'll be a great bulky flyer with lots of resistances down the road, but leaves quite a bit to be desired in the early game. Spiro isn't available until Route 35, just before the second gym. He's still a great option as he'll get Aerial Ace at Bugsy's level cap of 17, but won't evolve until 20, one level after Whitney's level cap. There are other options too like Dodrio and Skarmory if you're playing Soul Silver, but you won't see these guys until much later, like after you get the Fly HM. So again, there's a role to be filled in Heart Gold Soul Silver for a mixed attacking flyer that's available early and remains decent throughout the entire game. So that's the niche I'm going to try to pigeonhole us into. With all that in mind, I want to start with our abilities this time. We've got a couple basic normal bird abilities in Kenai, which prevents accuracy loss, and Tangled Feet, which raises evasion by one stage when confused. Now both these abilities will rarely be useful, which is fine, but they should at least make sense. Kenai, you're okay. A Hawkeye like Pidgeot could totally have this ability, but Tangled Feet? Go home, you're drunk. Again, Pidgeot is an expert flyer who trained his whole life to be in the skies. I could definitely see this on a sillier Pokemon like Dodrio, but for Pidgeot, we can do better. So I'm going to replace it with Early Bird, which is much more fitting. Again, Pidgeot in my head is a super disciplined and proud sovereign of the sky. I feel like he sets his alarm super early to get in his training regime and go for a morning flight or something. It's still not a great ability, but for a common Route 1 bird, we shouldn't be giving it the best ability of all time. Right, Star Raptor? So with that, I hope you can kind of see the vibe I'm going with here. Let's jump into the moveset. Now Pidgey isn't a bad Pokemon, and I don't want to stray too far from the Route 1 bird motif, so I'm going to make a lot of subtle changes. We're going to start small with Pidgey. In our first form, we learn Tackle, Sand Attack, Gust, Quick Attack, and Whirlwind. I'm going to trim the fat here by deleting Tackle at level 1 and moving Quick Attack down there to replace it, making room for Whirlwind to be brought down to level 13 instead of 17. These first set of moves all make enough sense, but Tackle and Quick Attack are too interchangeable, and Tackle on a bird makes less sense to me out of the two. I don't think we're breaking the meta by bringing it down to level 1, as we learn it before the first gym leader anyway. I also considered swapping Sand Attack for Mud Slap, as in my head, Mud Slap is just Sand Attack except it does damage, but I showed some restraint here. I doubt Pidgey could pick up a ball of mud since it has no hands. Yeah, we can learn it via Move Tutor already, so it is possible, but the first two gyms have flying type aces anyway, so oddly enough, Sand Attack is kind of the better option in this case because it's a status move, so it can actually hit those flying types. Gust is fine here too as our basic flying move. The alternative is Peck, which is also feasible, but the Dex loves to talk about how powerful our wings are, not our beak. And this sets a precedent for both physical and special options, even though it is usually better to favor one. Next, I'm going to pull down our evolution from one level from 18 to 17, so we can evolve before Bugsy. A power boost at this point in the game definitely gives us a leg up on Spiro, who has also become available around this point, especially when accompanied with the change I'm going to make next. So if you'll remember, since we moved Whirlwind down to 13, we've got an empty move slot, which I'll fill with Aerial Ace. Now that we're evolved, our flight skills are starting to come into form, and I feel like a move called Aerial Ace is the perfect move to reflect this. I feel like we're a lot more deserving of this move than Spiro, who also learns it at the same level. It feels like a huge oversight that we don't get a decent flying move until Wing Attack at 37 when we're fully evolved, so this fixes that problem too. Regardless, this makes us a much more viable option against Bugsy than we were before. Pidgeotto usually learns Twister at level 22, a move I kinda like despite how weak it is. It really shows that our powerful wings are coming into form, accompanied with some interesting but ultimately meaningless move diversity but I'm going to pull it down two levels to level 20 to squeeze in Tailwind at level 24. We originally learned this move at level 50, which is way too late for how mediocre it is in a single player setting. But it does reflect the Pokemon's MO, so I do still want it. I think it's actually really good for what we're going for. 
since Pidgeot is the only one who graduated flight school, it makes sense that he picked up little utility moves like this along the way. With our strong wings, we can create a gust that doubles the speed of our whole team for a few turns. I feel like this is a good move for the noble, good guy team player, and might be interesting to build a team around. Next, we'd usually learn Feather Dance at level 27, but I'm going to push it till later. Feather Dance is still a unique ability that separates us from the flock, but we could use some better moves in the mid game, so I'm going to replace it with Roost. You might think that this is a waste, since we already get this as a TM from Faulkner, but I'd counter with the argument that this is Gen 4, where TMs are not reusable. In certain settings like a Nuzlocke, you may not want to waste this move on a Pokemon that might get outclassed later on, so learning this naturally is a pretty good upside in my book. And again, it makes sense that Pidgeotto would learn this move naturally compared to the other birds. On top of that, we make pretty good use out of Roost with our balanced defensive stats, better than most of the competition so this rounds us out quite well. Like Tailwind, we do learn this a lot later, but we'll be filling our later moves with ones that make more sense at that stage in the game. I feel like this makes more sense for Pidgeotto to learn instead of Pidgeot, because our flight skills are not quite mastered yet. We may need to land on the ground to take a few breaks every now and then. Next, I'm actually going to make a change in a similar vein and remove Agility at level 32. This move makes sense, I guess? Like, yeah, we're fast, but we definitely don't need it. Game Freak loves giving this move to Pokémon who are already fast and don't need the speed boost, as opposed to slow mons that actually do. So I'm going to fill this slot with U-Turn, a move that, again, we get from Bugsy as a TM, but I feel like my point makes even more sense here, since U-Turn is a much more widely applicable move, and there's a lot more candidates you may want to use it on, so not having to waste it on Pidgeotto is not to be overlooked. Again, U-Turn sounds like a move that an expert pilot could pull off, so learning it naturally is right up our alley. I feel like this allows Pidgeot to act as one of the better pivots in the game, potentially setting up Tailwind, or debuffing the opponent with Feather Dance before U-Turning out into a teammate best equipped for the situation. Lastly for Pidgeotto, I'm going to pull down our evolution as well to level 34 instead of 36. This is for a couple reasons. The first is that it'll allow us to be fully evolved against two more gyms. Seven badges is pretty late for a full evolution. Pokemon like Fero, Noctowl, and Crobat all fully evolved a long time ago. This is at the point of the game where Pidgeotto really starts to slip, so I'm trying to minimize that as best I can. Also, our evolutions used to be 18 and 36, and 18 times 2 is 36, and 17 times 2 is 34, so I'm just trying to keep with the pattern here. You get it. Okay, so now we're finally in our top form with Pidgeot. Now we can finally spread our wings with our move pool. I'm going to swap the extremely late wing attack with Air Slash at level 38. This is a recurring issue, but we do learn this move later at 62, which is way too late for a move that's not as amazing as Game Freak seems to think it is. I like Air Slash as a special option to show that we're a mixed attacker when necessary, but again, this is just way too late. Next, I'm going to bring back Feather Dance at level 44 in place of Roost. I don't feel bad for pushing this so late because Roost is probably much more useful, but it will be nice to have this for the Elite Four, I think. After that, at level 50, we have an empty move slot originally filled by Tailwind that I'm going to fill with a move that might be controversial with Extreme Speed. This is a move that's reserved mostly for Legendaries, but also a few other Pokémon that are, for lack of a better word, special, like Arcanine, Lucario, and Togekiss. But hey, some common Pokémon like Zigzagoon can learn it via breeding, so I feel okay giving it to Pidgeot. Come on, we are literally flying at Mach 2, like that is some extreme speed. This change isn't that big of a deal anyway, since Return is still the better normal type move. I just feel like this fits Pidgeot's character, and we needed some cool late game moves, so sue me. Pidgeot would usually learn Mirror Move at level 56, which I absolutely hate for a couple reasons. One, this move sucks. Why do we learn it so late? This is not the ultimate move Game Freak seems to think it is. Two, I really don't understand it. Like, why is it a flying move? And why do so many DEX entries love talking about it? Is this some kind of Japanese translation issue? Let me know in the comments if you know this. And three, 
Despite all of that, I don't think it's a good move for Pidgeot. Copying someone else's tactics is a bit too cheeky, too below the belt. It feels like something Fira would do, but Pidgeot is above that. I really don't care what I replace it with, as long as it's not this. And I know that it's not a good move in-game either, but I ended up deciding on Defog, another niche utility move that makes use of our strong wings. This is mostly a character-based decision rather than a gameplay one. It's another move that advertises Pidgeot as a pivot who can help out the whole team by removing screens and lowering evasion. And don't think about it too hard because this is after the Elite Four level cap anyway. I thought about adding Steel Wing or even Heat Wave, which we can learn via the Move Tutor, but again, we are a common Route 1 bird. We shouldn't be getting too fancy in our level up moveset. Even Hyper Voice seemed a bit odd, since nothing in the decks mentions this line singing or chirping at all. Finally, in our ultimate move slot at level 62, since we've already switched out Air Slash, I'm going to replace it with Brave Bird, a much more fitting ultimate late game move that I could definitely see Pidgeot using. Like this is a pretty brave bird, right? I feel like good guy Pidgeot would totally risk his life for his team and his trainer, and we could use a little more physical power that not all flying types have access to. Okay passengers, this is your captain speaking. We are finally through all the changes, and it's time to take our new Pokemon for a test flight. I think I want to use a full team of 6 for this run, on top of the usual rules of no items in battle and playing on set mode. Prepare for takeoff. So starting off, I decide to go with Cyndaquil as my starter. He won't really play into the team I'm trying to build, but I already made a whole video about Chikorita, and there are other water types I want to use besides Totodile. Plus, Cyndaquil is easily the cutest. After that, I catch a Pidgey on Route 29. I make sure to grab one with our new ability Early Bird, even though it may never come in handy. We have a serious nature, which is not only solid, being a mixed attacker, but also very fitting. As a master pilot, we take our craft very seriously. I name her Ace. Yes, I know. The sky is falling. <gasps> Commander Little, no! Please call me Ace. Again, we now know Quick Attack at level 1 instead of Tackle. It'll be nice to not have to worry about Tackle missing 5% of the time. As I grind against other Wild Pidgey, I'll remind you that Opposing Pidgey will also have the same changes I made to this line. Unlike the Psyduck video, this will actually become a prominent factor, I think. It'll be interesting to see if the Faulkner fight changes. But before that, on Route 32, I catch a Mareep to add to my team. The general vibe I'm going for for this team is Pokemon who can hit like a truck, but are hindered by their speed to hopefully play around moves like Tailwind, and I feel like Mareep, as overused as he is, is a pretty great example of this. So it should go without saying that we do pretty well in Bellsprout Tower. Even regular Pidgey would have Gus at this point, so it's not saying much, but having Quick Attack which is slightly stronger than Tackle and doesn't miss has been really nice. Plus, we get to see Early Bird come into play here, when the Sage's Hoot Hoot puts us to sleep. It takes us 3 turns to wake up, which means that this would have been a 5 turn sleep if we didn't have it. Regardless, we wake up and take out his other Bellsprout for a pretty easy fight. Okay, so the Faulkner fight is a bit interesting, but not because Pidgey actually pulls any extra weight. We do take out his Pidgey with some quick attacks, but we can't compete with his evolved Pidgeotto. It's okay Pidgey, we don't cheat like Faulkner. You evolve when you're ready. But I noticed that Pidgeotto uses Tackle here, not Quick Attack, which means that Gym Leader battles will not read from the moveset changes I make. I guess I'd prefer that, since Pidgeotto knowing Roost is more of a challenge than knowing Whirlwind, just thought I'd point this out, as I'm kinda learning this stuff as I go. Regardless, Mareep is able to finish the fight with a couple of Thundershocks. After that, we evolve into Pidgeotto now at Bugsy's level cap of 17, and learn the move Aerial Ace in the process. Hopefully, this will give us a little more firepower for the upcoming gym battle. I'm hoping this is the point where we really start to outmuscle the other birds. Onto the Bugsy fight, and wow, this fight is free. We demolish his entire team with Aerial Ace. Even a crit from Scyther's quick attack wouldn't have killed us, since we've gotten bulkier after evolving. You could argue that these changes are kinda overkill, but again, the early game is the niche I wanted to fill the most, where we most needed to be strong, since the other birds are weak early on. 
Plus, it's not like Aerial Ace isn't going to fall off later, so yeah, this fight pretty much went exactly how I want it. I know there are quite a few Pokemon like Geodude who can also handle this fight pretty well, but I think Pidgeotto might be even more foolproof than that, since Rock Throw can miss if you're really unlucky, and other mods like Spiro or Zubat may not be bulky enough to land a critical hit from Scyther. So yeah, Pidgeotto makes this a guaranteed win, which is great for us, because this is a tough fight if you don't have the right encounters. After that, in Goldenrod City, I decided to trade a Drowsy I caught for the Machop in the Goldenrod department store. Machop is another Pokemon that hits ridiculously hard when he actually gets to move, so hopefully we can use that to our advantage. Now I could have waited till Mount Mortar to catch my own Machop, but let's be real, this is hard gold. We all know how rough the experience curve is, and I could use the 50% experience boost from traded Pokemon. Also in the Goldenrod department store, I wait till Sunday to get the return TM from this lady, which will give us a very strong stab normal move at this point in the game. So I don't really have a strategy for this Whitney fight, but I do lead with Pidgeotto and take out the Clefairy with a couple returns. I decide that the best thing I can do to the Miltank is get off a couple sand attacks to avoid a rollout sweep. I then pivot into Flaffy and Thunder Wafer twice to paralyze it because it's holding a Lumberry. After that, I head into Quillava, who gets off a Leer and an Ember before switching into Machop, who can finish the fight off now that this monster of a Pokemon is paralyzed, has low accuracy, and defenses. Even though Pidgeotto did nothing it couldn't do originally, this was still a fun fight. I'm glad our whole team pulled their weight. On our way to Ecruteague City, I decide to add the guaranteed Pseudo Wudo to our team. He's another Pokemon who wishes he was a bit faster, and maybe we can give that to him. He also has an interesting move pool which should be fun to use. Time for the Burn Tower rival fight. I lead Flaffy against his Ghastly and take him out with a few Thundershocks. He gets a curse on us, so I pivot into Pidgeotto to face Croconaw. We learn Tailwind now, so I get one off before pivoting back into Flaffy to hit another Thundershock. This was the moment where my heart sank. Our Tailwind peters out. Apparently in Gen 4, Tailwind only lasts 3 measly turns. That is awful in single battles. I thought it was 4 or maybe even 5. And I built my whole team around this move. If I could go back in time, I would edit this move to make it last longer, maybe only when holding the light clay, or in rain or hail since the wind is stronger during a storm. I strongly considered going back to the drawing board and tweaking this move slot. I originally played with the idea of putting Encore here instead, but Tailwind seemed like it fit Pidgeotto perfectly. In my first video, I mentioned how I would not go back to make changes once I start the run, and I will remain faithful to that here. Let me know in the comments how you think I should go about this in the future, and what move you would have put here. Personally, I treat the playthrough portion of these videos like testing a hypothesis, and unfortunately, they can't all be winners. It's a pretty big oversight on my part, but I'm going to continue with the run with what we've got. Oh yeah, we win the rival fight by the way. Okay, after that, I need a punching bag right now, and Morty will do just fine. I'm glad we have Aerial Ace here, as his Pokemon are pretty physically frail. His Ghastly gets off a curse on us, so I pivot into Flaffy to shake it off, who gets put to sleep. I switch back into Pidgeotto predicting the Dream Eater, and take out the Haunter while getting cursed again in the process. Again, I shake it off by switching into Flaffy who gets mean looked and then killed with a critical hit Shadow Ball. Yikes, sorry Flaffy. But Ace can take the rest of this fight, since Gengar can only hit us with Sucker Punch, which only does damage if I attack that turn. I can play around that with Tailwind, which does make us faster as well. He lands Hypnosis a bunch, but we really don't care because we have Early Bird. All in all, Pidgeotto has become a pretty insane counter to this fight. I know Firo is fully evolved in this point, and probably Crobat too, but even though they hit harder, I'm not sure if they'd be able to one-shot Haunter or Gengar either, unless EV trained. I don't think it's too big a stretch to say Pidgeotto is still the best bird up to this point in the game, which is definitely worth something. Okay, I'm happy again. After that, I decided to fill in my last team slot with Lapras from Union Cave. This was another Pokemon who I thought would make great use out of Tailwind since he's a bit on the slow side, but I feel like we'll still get some use out of him anyway. Besides, who doesn't like Lapras? Time for Chuck, and this is another fight that goes perfectly. He leads with Primeape, who loves to spam Double Team so we can land Focus Punch. 
However, now that we have Aerial Ace, which can't miss, we hard counter him. Next comes his Polyrath, who likes to use Hypnosis, but again, we have Early Bird, so our odds of waking up anyway are pretty good. Now he does miss all of his Hypnosis in this fight, but I'm still extremely impressed with Pidgeotto at this point in the game. I can see our physical damage starting to fall off, but we hit hard enough and can two-shot most things. Keeping our momentum going, we evolve into Pidgeot at level 34 now, which is at the next Gym Leader Price's level cap. I'm pretty interested in seeing how we fare in our final form. With the latest evolution of all birds in the game, I feel like Pidgeotto was supposed to be weak up until now, but ironically, this is the part where I foresee us starting to fall off. I guess we'll see. So despite being weak to ice, I decided to take our new evolution for a test flight. We're pretty fast now, and we still outspeed the seal after having our speed dropped by Icy Wind. We take it out with a couple returns. Dugong's Aurora Beam hits us pretty hard, so I pivot into Ampharos. Dugong is pretty bulky, but we eventually take him out with a few Thunder Punches. Last is his Piloswine, and I read the ground move here and switch back into Pidgeot, who is immune. Then, I predict the ice move and go for a Roost, which removes our flying type for a turn, so we're neutral instead of weak to it. I decide to Roost again, and he misses the Ice Fang. I decide to hit a couple returns while he sets up Hail, and then goes for the perfect accuracy Blizzard, which we actually live from full health. Nice to see our natural bulk come into play. Now, I can U-turn into Lapras who can tank some ice moves and not risk getting frozen, and finish the fight with a couple surfs. I'm pretty happy with how this fight went. We did decent damage against some bulky mons here, and got into some fun predicting and pivoting. I kinda like that the smarter you play, the more use you can make out of Pidgeot. Kinda goes with our character, I think. Whereas with Firo, we'd probably just be mashing Drill Peck in return. Good fight. Unfortunately, the next gym is pretty much a no-fly zone for us. But that's fine, because Quilava ends this battle in 3 turns with Choice Specs Lava Plume. I want to retract my statement from my first video, when I said that Chikorita might be the best starter against Jasmine. Yeah, Quilava always cleans this fight up, it's no contest. Time for all the Team Rocket padding. We have Air Slash now, so I try my luck with spamming Choice Specs Air Slash against all of Petrol's coughing and wheezing, who all have pretty low special defense. And this is a really clean fight, we don't even take any damage. The fact that you get free choice specs in this game makes special attackers slightly more viable than physical attackers on average, so I'm glad Pidgeot can make good use of that, while not abandoning stab return entirely. I'm super glad I pulled down Air Slash to have by this point in the game, because return probably doesn't one-shot here, even from Firo or Dodrio. Every fight we use Pidgeot, I appreciate something more about her. I'm shocked we haven't fallen off yet. Let's keep the momentum going. The penultimate rival fight goes pretty okay too. Pidgeot makes a pretty great lead in most fights, so I one-shot the Golbat before U-turning into Typhlosion for the Magnemite who takes it out. Eventually. I switch into Ampharos to take out the Feraligator and Sneasel with a few discharges, and I figured Pidgeot would make a pretty good counter to Haunter. He doesn't end up going for a Ghost move, but he still can't really touch us. Upon realizing this, he kills himself with a curse. I'll jump forward now to the final gym leader, Claire. There's really not much to this fight. We take out her lead Gyarados with a discharge from Ampharos before switching into Lapras to take out her two Dragonair with Ice Beams. But her Ace Kingdra proves to be too much, taking us out. I decide to use this as an opportunity to see how much return would do from Pidgeot. Kingdra has about half health left, and we unfortunately leave it with just a sliver. And it outspeeds us shockingly, so I have to sack Pseudo Wudo who gets blasted with a Sniper Crit Dragon Pulse. I finish the fight with a Revenge Sweep from Machamp. I feel like this is the first sign of Pidgeot's damage output starting to fall off. We're going to be going up against some fully EV trained Pokemon in the Elite Four, so we probably won't be able to rely on raw damage from now on. Next, I'm going to show the series of fights against the 5 Kimono Girls at the Ecritique Dance Theater. These fights can be pretty tough, since they each use one of the Evolutions, which is a pretty diverse lineup, not just type-wise, but stat-wise as well. No Pokémon is equipped to handle all 5 of these fights, and you can't switch your lead Pokémon between each battle. But having a fast pivot like Pidgeot is great for us here, since we can get some chip on these bulky Pokémon and you turn into a team member more equipped for the situation. So yeah, another late game fight where Pidgeot is still very useful. Right before the Elite Four is the final rival fight. 
As always, I go with Pidgeot as our lead and one-shot the Sneasel with a U-turn, pivoting into Lapras. He takes out the Magneton with a couple Surfs and the Haunter comes out. I correctly predict a Ghost move by switching back into Pidgeot and take it out with a couple Air Slashes. This brings in Feraligator, who can also whittle down with a few Air Slashes combined with a Feather Dance and Roost every now and then. Now we could have finished this fight with Pidgeot if the ensuing Golbat didn't confuse us and then make us hit ourselves in confusion three times in a row, but whatever, Sudowoodo gets the job done. Overall, Pidgeot was a pretty solid answer to Silver's entire team except Magneton. U-Turn can one-shot both his Sneasel and Kadabra while simultaneously keeping the momentum in our favor. I'm happy with our performance against him overall. But it's not over yet. Time for the Pokemon League. I've only leveled up Pidgeot to the cap of level 47, and kept the rest at 45. I'm not going to be soloing with Pidgeot this time, one, because I don't think she can, and two, because we're not supposed to be a sweeper, but a lead pivot. We'll see just how much weight we end up pulling in the end. Alright, let's do this. First up is Will and his Psychic types. This time, I decide to lead with Scarf Labrys, who can one-shot the lead Zatu with an Ice Beam. He brings in Jinx, so I switch into Typhlosion to take it out with a Flamethrower. Slowbro comes out, so I bring in Ampharos to one-shot it with a Specs Discharge. In comes Executor, so I swap in Pidgeot. He goes for Hypnosis, and I'm glad he does because we get to see a one-turn early bird wake up one last time before one-shotting it with a quad effective... Oh. Okay, he lives with a sliver, so I switch back into Ampharos to take it out with a spec signal beam. His last Zatu confuses us, so I bring Lapras back in to finish the fight with a couple ice beams. This wasn't Pidgeot's finest hour, and I'm not afraid to show that. As I predicted, we're struggling to find a place in these Elite Four fights already. But Koga uses some bug types, so maybe we'll find a niche there. Unfortunately, we don't fare too well here either. I do lead with Pidgeot, which is objectively the wrong play, and you'll see why. We just barely miss out on the kill with Air Slash on Ariados, and the Fortress takes a few hits to take down too. This allows it to set up nasty stuff like Toxic Spikes, when Typhlosion could have easily cleaned up these two with Flamethrower. I thought we could at least wall them up with Feather Dance, but turns out he has Toxic, so I cut my losses and finish the fight with Pseudo Widow and Ampharos. We're starting to see our power level fall off a bit. Well, it's not really our stats, but the fact that there's really not much of a reason to bring a normal flying type into the Johto League. Even Firo and Dodrio wouldn't be that useful, as I'd still crush most of these fights with Typhlosion and Ampharos instead. It's an unfortunate reality, but not one I'm afraid to admit. Pidgeot carried hard for the first, like, 80% of the game. Just because we fall off at the Pokemon League does not mean this Pokemon has no use. But I was determined to get our use of her, against Bruno at least. He leads Hitmontop, and we dodge the counter by using a special attack, which is nice. I know the Hitmonchan's elemental punches will hurt, so I pivot into Machamp to take it out with Revenge. Hitmonlee also hits hard with High Jump Kick, so I let Machamp go down here. I go for Feather Dance here, when an Air Slash probably would have killed, and then he annoyingly sets up Swagger, so I switch into Ampharos to take him out. When Onyx comes out, I read the Earthquake and pivot back into Pidgeot. Here, I stubbornly take it out with like 7 Air Slashes, Half of the reason being, I want to make use out of Pidgeot, the other half because I want to laugh at how little Onyx Rock Slide does. Like this is embarrassing Bruno, why do you not have a Primeape or a Poliwrath my guy? Regardless, we finally take out Onyx and can even wall them a champ after feather dancing it. Yeah, we risk a lot of critical hits here and Cross Chop is a high crit move, but nah, it didn't happen. So yeah, at least we could say we were useful in one of these fights. I can honestly say I take Pidgeot here over all the other normal birds, because they're either too frail to tank a rock move, or can't debuff the physical attackers like Pidgeot can. But again, this is Bruno, so I'm not awarding too many points. On to Karen, and this is a pretty messy fight. I lead with Scarf Machamp to one-shot the Umbreon before it does anything annoying. She brings out Murkrow next when I was expecting the Gengar. It apparently outspeeds us and hits a hard pluck before we take it out as well. Now the Gengar comes out, and I try to read the Ghost move, but it goes for Focus Blast instead. I try to stall it out of Focus Blast with Roost, but this Gengar has the tech, and uses Spite to delete my remaining TP. I U-turn into Typhlosion to hit it with a super effective Shadow Claw, which knocks him into half health. I know another Shadow Claw won't take him out, but he outspeeds us, and I know another hit will knock me into Blaze. So a Blaze boosted Flamethrower takes him out. 
I have no clean answer to her Houndoom, so I switch into Pseudo Wudo, who ends up being a sack to two Dark Pulses. Lapras enters the empty field and takes Houndoom out with a couple surfs before her Vileplume takes us down and Pidgeot can finish the fight. I don't know what to say about that really. I guess Pidgeot was as useful as any of the other team members, but I have a feeling Lance will be a bit tougher. So this is a really tough champion fight with the team we've got. I lead Ampharos to deal with the Gyarados, but have to end up sacking him to his ace Dragonite. I've got Scarfed Lapras with Ice Beam waiting in the back, but this Dragonite in particular has a special defense boosting nature, so we actually need some chip damage on it first. The best mod for the job is actually Pidgeot, because she's the only one fast enough to debuff it with Feather Dance, and bulky enough to tank Outrageous before it becomes confused. We heal with Roos in the meantime, while shaking off all five of his Fire Blasts. When the time is right, I switch into Lapras to finish it off. This brings out Aerodactyl, which is another serious threat. I'm locked into Ice Beam, which won't take it out, and it's faster, even though we're Choice Scarfed. I need Lapras alive to deal with the rest of his team, so I have to sack my most useless team member, which is Typhlosion. Sorry, buddy. I decide to leave this job in the hands of Big Man, the only man big enough to handle the job. He dishes out a couple rock slides, but chokes at the finish line, flinching from a rock slide so we get finished off. I have priority Ice Shard on Lapras, but I don't think it'd be enough to take it out, so the safest play is to hope Machamp can live in Aerial Ace, which he does, and we take it out with a Revenge. But I do have to let him go down when the Charizard comes out, so we can bring Lapras back in and take it out with a couple Surfs. I need a pivot for his last two Dragonite, since again, I'm locked into Surf, so I bring back Pidgeot one last time for a sack. I know this Dragonite has Thunder, so we can't wall this one. Okay, I appreciate the effort, Pidgeot, but I need you to go down here. Thank you. Finally, I can bring Lapras back to finish off the last two Dragonite with Ice Beams, winning us the battle, and the run. Yeah, I'm ending the run here. I think it's pretty clear Pidgeot has fallen off in the late game, and I don't see the value in playing all the way through Kanto and grinding a full team of 6 Pokemon 30 levels just for one fight that I don't think Pidgeot would be that great in anyway. We'd probably just Brave Bird the Venusaur, maybe Feather Dance the Snorlax, and that's about it. Half of Red's team has 100% accurate Blizzard, so yeah, I just don't think it's worth it. I know it's a bit of an anti-climax, but I'd rather get started on the next video, which is going to be a fun one. So anyway, I have mixed feelings about that run. I'm still super bummed about Tailwind because I think it really would have come in handy for the champion fight. We would set up a Tailwind, switch into Lapras, and take out like half of Lance's team before it expired with Ice Beam and Thunderbolt. But I'm glad we were able to run it with Pidgeot regardless. I was actually shocked how much Aerial Ace and Early Bird helped out. We definitely found our niche for the early to mid game. I think Pidgeotto with these conditions actually makes Bugsy, Morty, and Chuck pretty much free. That's 3 out of the first 5 gym leaders, so that is pretty impressive. It turns out, the Pidgey line didn't need anything crazy to be good. Just a few subtle changes. I'm glad I didn't stray too far from the Route 1 bird aesthetic, while also giving us enough useful tools to separate us from the crowd like U-Turn and Feather Dance. So yeah, I'm satisfied, but what about you? Let me know if you'd make any other changes in the comments below. Next time, we'll be going through Gen 3 Kanto for real this time. I'm going to start upping the ante with some really weak Pokemon in the next couple videos. Pokemon that challenge the very definition of the word usable. Feel free to guess who you think is next and who you'd like to see in the future. Until then, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.